Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. And today we're picking up on a discussion that we had in our last episode about Jacob and Joseph and the Israelites in Egypt. Is there archaeological evidence connected to their living there during the sojourn? And uh, can we demonstrate the historical reliability of the Bible based on that evidence? And to talk about all of that, uh, I'm joined again today by my co-host, Scott Lancer. Scott, Thank welcome you. back once Thank again. You. Thank you very and, much. And uh, our resident archaeological expert, Dr. Bryant <laughs> Wood, um, who has uh, studied quite extensively uh, this area related to Egypt and the Israelites. So we're going to jump right back into it, gentlemen. Uh, we're going to ask our audience, make sure you go back and watch the first episode. Uh, in fact, going to watch all three of them together if, if, if they can. So Scott, you're going to pick up on our conversation about a tomb and a statue right, that was right. found yes, in Egypt. That's right. And uh, we were talking about Ramses and we were talking about this monumental tomb that was discovered and the statue. Um, in this Asiatic settlement there. And so, Bryant, uh, we, we, we started to talk about that, but there's a lot of uh, a lot more interesting details we can mm. add to that today. Yes, this uh, material coming out of Egypt is just very fascinating and connects, I think, quite directly with the biblical record. You know, mm -hmm. uh, one of the arguments that scholars used to say that there was never an exodus, never a conquest, is that, well, we have no proof that the Israelites lived in Egypt. Uh, one of those arguments from silence. Well, I think now we do have proof. Uh, excavations have been going on at this site in the Eastern Delta, Tel El Daba, since the mid-1970s. They're still mm -hmm. digging there. It's an Austrian uh, organization, uh, very scientific and academic and uh, doing a just a fantastic job of excavating, processing, analyzing, testing uh, carbon-14 and all kinds of uh, yes. things and publishing, publishing, publishing. Uh, and I believe it's all, uh, much of the material uh, we can relate to the Israelite sojourn in Egypt that we mm -hmm. talked mm -hmm. in our previous episode about the village of yes. Asiatics, people from Canaan, who were pastoralists, evidence that they were pastoralists, as the Israelites were, of course, uh, dating to the exact uh, time period of Jacob and his family when they first came in. And we mentioned the uh, cemetery that was part of this little village. And uh, many of the tombs are just ordinary, single individual tombs. What's interesting, a lot of them have donkey burials outside mm -hmm. the tomb. That's a character trait of these uh, Asiatic people, so-called, uh, uh, from Canaan. And uh, even we find it uh, in Syria, in the right? area that, uh, you know, the Israelites uh, originated from. Uh, and so that seems to be perhaps a, a practice of, of the Israelites. Uh, was the burial of donkeys, which were very, very important in mm -hmm. their culture. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was one tomb in particular which stood out in this cemetery that is totally different from the normal tomb of a single burial, with the, which the excavators refer to as warrior burials, because mm -hmm. there was many times weapons found in the tombs. In the tombs yeah. Well, in this uh, one tomb, it's what as Scott mentioned, a monumental tomb, much larger than any of the others. And it was a, a building, not just a grave. It was a, a building. Uh, it was thought that perhaps there was a kind of a little pyramid on the top. Mm -hmm. There was an entry room and a little uh, passageway going into the main uh, burial area. Well, they did not find actually uh, any tomb goods or even a skeleton or anything like that. But what they did found, find was uh, fragments of a statue that had been broken up, interestingly enough, uh, intentionally in antiquity. In fact, some pieces were found uh, in other areas nearby that had been carted off. And uh, <clears throat> Turns out this statue uh, was of an Asiatic, mm -hmm. not an Egyptian. 
Well, how do we know that? Well, if you look at the, we have the, the part of the head. Yeah. If you look at that head, you'll see it has a, what's called a mushroom hairstyle. Yeah, it's like, it's the way it's depicted in the pictures too, the, yeah. the paintings, right? In, in, in the yeah. tomb paintings. Non-Egyptian. This, this is how the Egyptians depicted Asiatics, people from Canaan or Syria in that area. And so this is a non-Egyptian, there was some even a paint little bit of paint still surviving, the same color that they used to paint Asiatics, you know, a little yeah. kind of a yellowish uh, color. Um, and uh, it had a, a throw stick uh, held in one hand over the shoulder, something again that's Asiatic, it's not Egyptian at all. Uh, had quite a decorative uh, garment on with some paint, red and blue, I think, a flex of paint. Uh, still surviving, and it was very large. It wasn't just a life-size statue of a person. It was one and a half times life-size. And so the question is, who, who, who is, is this? Yeah. And what's he doing there? Uh, obviously, it was somebody important. You know, uh, you think, well, maybe an Asiatic official or something like that. Some uh, have suggested it's a statue of Joseph himself. But uh, research by a colleague of ours, one of our research associates, Doug Douglas Petrovich, he's uh, come up with a much different idea about it, and I think he's quite right that it's probably Jacob because he was honored. Uh, he was the head of the clan, of course, yes. that came in. Probably the four-room house that we talked about earlier the biggest house, the major house in the village, probably that was his house. And so we can't say 100% because there's no inscription. Right, it doesn't say he's, no. Jacob lies here. Or, no, uh, yes. no. But with all of our other evidence suggesting that the Israelites did live here, yes, it makes a lot of sense that this was the patriarch of the clan and that this was his tomb. Wow, that's, a, that's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, we uh, and 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 part of the argument that you put together. I got about thirty seconds here, uh, so I'll wrap it up and then we'll pick up some more after the break. Is really not just about the statue because in and of itself you can't prove that's Jacob, but it's this larger context: the four-room house, right time, right place, Asiatic, very important person, uh, and he would have had great stature because he was Joseph's dad. Sure. So that all makes kind of sense when you put that all together. Absolutely. We're looking forward to seeing what Doug has to say in detail about that. <laughs> well, folks, we're just getting started. Uh, again, they discovered a statue in Egypt that we think is connected to the Israelites, pretty good evidence that it actually is a depiction of Jacob. And um, we'll be right back in just a few moments after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and today uh, we're having a great roundtable discussion talking about the Israelites in Egypt and the archaeological evidence associated with the biblical text from this time, particularly in the book of Genesis. I'm joined by my colleague, Scott Lancer, and of course, Dr. Bryant Wood, who's here to tell us all about the archaeology from this time period in the right place, what we always say, our, our colleague Gary Byer says, it's in the right place at the right time. Yep. And uh, so we're going to pick up here, uh, Brian, we talked about the statue that we think is connected to J uh, Jacob, excuse me. Uh, let's talk about uh, Joseph and his interconnection with the sort of the two pharaohs, the one who appointed him as an official mm -hmm. and his office and the famine. So let's just talk about that a little bit because that fits nice too. Yes. 
Well, fortunately, in the Bible, we have a lot of details concerning the chronology of this time period. So we can put together a pretty good uh, timeline of yeah. when Joseph came in and when he was made the uh, overseer of Pharaoh's property and, and so on. Uh, and so when you compare that then with the uh, timeline for the Middle Kingdom, it turns out that we have two pharaohs of this time, which we can call perhaps uh, the pharaoh of the uh, years of plenty and the pharaoh of the years of famine, because the, they kind of uh, break right at the time between those two major seven-year periods. Yes. So uh, Sesostris II was the pharaoh of the uh, famine uh, years, or excuse me, the years of plenty. Yes. And uh, then uh, when we come to the time of the famine, we have a new pharaoh, Sesostris III. So it would have been Sesostris II that made Joseph this very important official. And again, there's so much Egyptian background in that yes. account of how uh, he was uh, sort of coronated, you might say, and uh, there's a ceremony involved, and we can compare that with similar events, uh, you know, in, in Egyptian history, and it just, it fits in perfectly. He's given yeah. a chariot and all these things. He's given an Egyptian wife, and uh, so just so many things there. Uh, but the significant thing is he was given this very uh, high position. And so then uh, uh, during that uh, time period of Sesostris II, they began to gather the food and, and lay it up and have it ready for the years of, of famine that were coming. And the years of famine then were under Sesostris III. Now we have something uh, very uh, unusual that takes place in Egyptian history at this time, and it has baffled uh, scholars. And that is, I, I mentioned in a, one of our earlier segments, the fact that Egypt was divided up into various smaller uh, units yes. called gnomes uh, with their own sort of a governor or leader called a nomarch. Now, these gnomes had great wealth and great power. And at that time, the pharaoh had very little power. Interesting. It, it was all uh, with these local uh, leaders. Gnomes. Yes. Uh, then, uh, in the reign of Sesostris III, suddenly, that all changes. And these uh, local <coughs> leaders are no longer the wealthy individuals they were, no, no longer uh, powerful. All the power and wealth now is with Pharaoh. I mean, this is a tremendous upheaval in the social economic system of Egypt. And it happened yeah. suddenly in the rule of this Pharaoh. And uh, uh, I have some quotes uh, that we could uh, look at from scholars Yes. Uh, from this time period. We can put those up on the screen yes. for our audience uh, to take a look at. You yep. can read through those quotes, and they describe this uh, change, and every scholar says, but we don't know why. We don't understand how this happened. Well, if we look in the Bible, we uh, read of jo Joseph's famine policy how he distributed uh, the food yes. during those famine years. And he had a very uh, uh, interesting policy how he went uh, about that. Uh, he first sold it to the Egyptians. When they ran out of money, then he took their animals. Until they ran out of animals, then he took their property until they ran out of property, yeah, yeah. then he took their person in a, in a sense, yeah. you know. Yes. Uh, yes. They were almost like slaves. But, uh, and what did he do with all that money? Well, of course, he was the administrator of the royal house. It all went to the royal family, the so pharaoh. It, so Joseph consolidated the wealth 
but the power was consolidated in the pharaoh. Yes. Because Joseph wasn't the pharaoh. No, he, he, was, was, he was. He was close. He was number two. He was number two. Yeah. That's fascinating. And so this, and it's at the, again, the right event at the right time. At the right time. time. Described yes. in detail in the Bible. Yeah. And at the end of uh, the, the years of, of, of famine, uh, Joseph levied a 20% tax on the people, which remained in effect throughout Egyptian history. Uh, the religious uh, institutions were exempted uh, from this. They were provided for and so on. But uh, that is the explanation that scholars are looking for, but they're not about to read their Bible and make the connection. But I think it's all there, fits perfectly, and shows the historical accuracy yeah. of the Bible. Now, they don't go back to the gnome structure. <coughs> No, no, no. Because no. once, 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 once government officials have power, they never give it up. <laughs> That's for we sure. We know that in the modern day, too. That's yep. the way it works, yep. right? The yep. more power is consolidated. Yep. So, in other words, Joseph wasn't trying to consolidate power for power's sake. He was trying to deal with the famine. Right. But the, but the consequence of it, in your view, was the consolidation of power well, and this lack of explanation in the scholarly realm about, yeah. well, what happened? Joseph worked for Pharaoh. Yeah. And so it all went to him. Yeah, how about that? Well, uh, Scott has a question for you about the coup Sebek Stila, but we're going to leave that for the audience for our next segment because we don't have enough time to cover it now. So don't go back, folks, because you want to find out about the coup Sebek Stila, and we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're talking about Joseph, Jacob, and the Israelites in Egypt, and does the archaeological record support what the biblical text tells us? And so far we've discovered, of course, not to our surprise, and hopefully not to yours, that we have great synchronisms and great evidence. So we're picked up uh, here. We were talking about, I left the audience with the Ku Sebek Stila, Scott. So you're going to explain, you're going you're gonna to ask about that, and Kusebex. Scott's going to tell us what, yep. uh, Dr. Wood's going to tell us what that's all about. That's right. Uh, in Genesis 50, Brian, you, you know all this, Joseph leads an expedition of the royal court to Shechem to bury his father, uh, Jacob, there around 1859 B.C. There's a, an important stela, the Kusebek stela, that uh, we want to kind of talk about in connection with that, mm -hmm. if you would. Yes, uh, this uh, stela was found in a tomb of a military officer that uh, was in Pharaoh's army. And he was involved in a very interesting uh, expedition to Canaan. Uh, he talks about going into Canaan. He talks about going to Shechem. And uh, his uh, heroism, I guess you'd say, he, he was in charge of the rear guard. And so uh, they were hit from behind by some Asiatics in the area of Shechem. Some marauders or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So he fought them off, and because of his great valor, he received an award from Pharaoh. So he's telling about this uh, event in his life uh, on this stela. So now, uh, what, what was Pharaoh's army doing uh, up in Canaan at this time. We have no record of really any military conquests or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, and the dating of it is right during the uh, time of uh, Joseph and Jacob, mm -hmm. and it, it dates to about the time of Jacob's death. Uh, well, in the Bible we have this very unusual, <laughs> fascinating story of Upon Jacob's death, he wanted to be buried in Canaan. He didn't want to be buried in a foreign country. 
and so Joseph makes all the arrangements to take him back to Canaan and bury him in Canaan. Now the family uh, burial place was actually at Hebron and uh, so uh, that's where uh, Joseph would have buried his father at Hebron. We have a traditional uh, tomb, like a, a memorial. It's not yes. the actual tomb, but uh, in the mosque at Hebron there, uh, we have the tomb of the patriarchs, it's called, and uh, Jacob is one of those individuals that uh, supposedly was buried there. Well, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, Joseph went to Pharaoh and said, well, I want to take my father back to Canaan, bury him there. And Pharaoh says, oh, by all means. And so they organized this big expedition of Joseph and the men of the families and uh, Egyptian officials and all these people made this procession into Canaan. And here we have this Kubek, Kusebek inscription at the same time of a military guy that went on an expedition and he, he passed by Shechem. Well, how, did, how would this relate to the burial of, of Jacob in uh, Hebron? Well, when you think about it, it does make some sense that the procession would not just have gone to Hebron and back, but would have made kind of a circuit. Uh, firstly, yeah. probably to visit Edom and Jacob's brother Esau, and that whole family, let mm -hmm. them know Jacob has passed. We're going to bury him over in Hebron. Then it makes a lot of sense to go up to Shechem. Why? Because uh, Joseph owned land there. His father, Jacob, gave him land in Shechem. In Shechem, yes. So he might have wanted to pass by Shechem, go into the uh, courthouse and say, look, my father gave me this land. Uh, he's passed, now it's mine, I want to make sure that it's my land in my name. Of course, yeah. we don't read about that, but I'm reading between the lines. Yes, yes, but it's logical, there's a certain yeah. logic to what you're arguing. And yeah. then from there they would go so south toward Hebron, and what place would they pass by but Bethlehem? And Bethlehem was an important place to Joseph because his mother was buried there. Okay. And so, I mean, he hasn't. He never saw his mother after he left uh, left Canaan, and so I can imagine that he would have wanted to visit his mother's tomb. We have a traditional tomb of Rachel there, yeah. but uh, yeah. whether it's authentic or not, it's another matter. And then finally, ending up at Hebron, giving the Jacob a, a burial there, and then back to Egypt. Well, very so good. So it these two things correlate very, very well, very nicely, yes. and a little bit of theorizing there, but sure. it, it, it it would make a lot of sense. It, this is Joseph's only trip to Canaan after he was sold into slavery. So I think he would have wanted to visit some of these places. Well, and he certainly had the authority and the means to be able to uh, do so. The blessing of Pharaoh. Okay, so we have a, a little bit more than a minute left, so what we need to do is set the stage for the next episode. So one of the things we're gonna talk about, I want you to touch on this for 45 seconds to a minute, is we get the impression in our Bible studies and in Sunday school that the whole time the Israelites were in Egypt that they were oppressed. Uh, but our research kind of shows something quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, not that they were not oppressed for the whole 430 years. So there's this intervening time. Jacob dies until this time comes of the book of Exodus. Why don't you set the stage a little bit for that, Bryant, for our next episode and just give the audience a little bit of what, what we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the amazing uh, outcomes of this work in Egypt is that it really gives us an insight into the sojourn period. In the Bible, we have a lot of detail about the beginning of the period, Joseph and Jacob and so on. A lot of detail at the end of the period, time of Moses, the Exodus. What happened in between? In between, yeah. Archaeology opens up that uh, because we have a continuous occupation by these Semites, these Asiatics. They're growing in number. They're prospering. And then toward the end of their time, yes. Uh, they are oppressed. Okay. And it all fits the biblical account, but it 
changes our thinking, I think, a little bit about their time in Egypt. They weren't oppressed the whole time. According to the archaeology, the last 100 years, maybe, of okay. the 430 years. Otherwise, from the archaeological evidence, they were doing very well. Well, let's leave it at that, Brian, and we're going to pick that up in our next episode of Digging for Truth. Make sure you join us for part three of this exciting series on the Israelites in Egypt. Thank you for joining us today.